I enlisted in 1964 to become a helicopter pilot. I knew I could be sent to war, but I was naive to think it would only happen in a national disaster. I didn't know anything about Vietnam. I didn't know that the French conquered Vietnam in 1887, after 20 years of trying. I didn't know that our country supported Ho Chi Minh to fight the Japanese during World War II. I didn't know that after the war the country, no longer colonial, was returned to the French by the occupying British with American consent. I didn't know that Ho Chi Minh had fought to expel the French since 1946 and achieved it in 1954, after their defeat at Dien Bien Phu. I did not know that the free elections scheduled for 1956 by the Geneva Conference were cancelled because it became clear that Ho Chi Minh would win. I did not know that our government supported the despotic and corrupt leader NGO DNG AIM and later had a hand in his overthrow and death in 1963. None of this I knew. But the people who started the war knew. I knew and wanted only one thing to be a pilot, and more than anything, a helicopter pilot. The experimental division tasked with testing the concept has caused the greatest interdepartmental controversy in years. There is some doubt as to how such air mobile units would fare in a real war. As a child I dreamed of levitation. I could take off, provided no one saw me, but if anyone peeked, it didn't work. I grew up on a farm. My father was the manager of his own and other people's farms, working the market in Pennsylvania, New Jersey and West Virginia. When I was nine, he started a large poultry farm west of Delray Beach, Florida. Here, in between chores, I dreamed of flying. Dreamed so hard that I actually built tall structures to get off the ground. When I went to middle school, my dad switched from farming to real estate, and we moved to town. I was in the penultimate grade and my friend, a freshly minted pilot, was teaching me the basics of flying a small airplane. The airplane was a huge step up from my ridiculous machinery it always took off. So by the time I graduated from high school, I had a private pilot's license. In 1962, after two years, I dropped out of the University of Florida and traveled the country. A year later, crucial events took place in Philadelphia. I met my future wife, patients, and enlisted in the army as a pilot candidate. When I arrived at the US, Army Helicopter Basic Training School at Fort Walters, Texas, in June 1964, my ultimate dream came true. I drove in through the main gate and lost my head helicopters, glided over low hills. Helicopters drew the sky overhead, helicopters were everywhere. Ray Ward, my comrade, stuck his head out of the car window and smiled. He, too, had joined the Army to become a helicopter pilot. We pulled up to a group of concrete buildings that looked like dormitories. At the entrance was a sign candidates for warrant officers are coming here. We were impressed. After basic training at Fort Dix and a month of advanced infantry training at Fort Polk, we were sure that all the military buildings were green WWWII wooden structures. I turned off the engine. Hey, it's nice out here. Ray smiled. Ask that guy over there where we should drop our luggage. The guy Ray was talking about was a sergeant. Wearing a white helmet and brightly coloured armbands, he walked silently toward us. We weren't cadets anymore, nothing to be afraid of, so I asked affably. Look, sergeant, where should we take the luggage? Luggage? He flinched at the word and looked us over. Ray and I were in plain clothes. Right. We have to report in by five and we need somewhere to change. Are you candidates? He asked calmly, with the kind of ill-concealed contempt I'd seen more than once in basic training. Yeah, I nodded, pulling myself up. So why the fuck are you rolling around in civilian clothes? What are you tourists? No. Put the car in the parking lot. Now. And you and your luggage over here. Now. Yes, Sergeant, I reported automatically. As I backed up, the sergeant glared at us with his fists on his hips. Turn the car around, Ray said. No time. We backed up all the way to the parking lot. Shit, Ray said. Looks like this isn't going to be a picnic. We didn't think the army taught us how to fly helicopters and march and shoot, but they did. 
120 candidates from our class were called warrant officer candidates. A warrant officer is not an officer they are commissioned, not given a rank, and they specialise in some narrow field. There are warrant officers, warrant electronics officers, warrant pilots and so on. The ranks of warrant officers WO1, CW2, CW3 and CW4 correspond to second lieutenant, first lieutenant, captain and major warrant officers have the same privileges and nearly the same pay as junior officers. When I first heard about the warrant pilot training programme, I was a civilian and cared little about rank. All I knew was that they flew. The flight training program lasted nine months. First there was a month of pre-flight and four months of initial flight training at Fort Walter, then we were flown to Fort Rucker, Alabama, where we had enhanced practice for another four months. The month of pre-flight training was a total humiliation to weed out candidates who were not capable of becoming leaders. If you passed this rite of passage, you were allowed into airplanes and taught to fly. Then you were tried and kicked out for mistakes or slowness, not to mention the constant insults you had to swallow. The pre-fleet Nikki did everything on the run, sat on the edge of chairs in the canteen, and in addition had to scrub the floors to a shine and make sure that clothes were hung in the closet, strictly according to the regulations. We were only allowed to leave the base for two hours on Sundays to go to church. All in all, the same crap as the basic training programme, only worse. The sergeant supervisors assigned us to various positions in the cadet company squad leader, platoon leader, first sergeant, deputy platoon leader, and so on. One of us was appointed as the commander of the cadet company. We would hold these positions for a week and the instructors would try to drive us to insanity and see how we reacted. Unfortunately, I was appointed the first cadet company commander. We had experienced combat veterans among us. The rest of us, including Ray and me, had just gotten out of training. To be honest, God should have seen to it that one of the experienced guys took the command position. But he, in the person of Sergeant Overseer Wayne Malone, rarely did the right thing. My first official assignment as commander was to lead the company to the mess hall four buildings away from the barracks. It's as simple as that. Attention. Left to right. Forward march. Halt. Break for meals. But SGT. Malone and his buddies and the senior cadets were obstructing me. They stood there and yelled in my face while I tried to line up the company at attention. Well, candidate. Are you going to the mess hall or not? shouted the senior cadet, almost touching his nose to mine. Yes, sir. If you'll let me pass, I'll... What? He was furious. Let you through. He was immediately joined by the others. How do you talk to your superiors, candidate? Get this lot into the mess hall before it closes. Yes, sir. I couldn't hear myself over the shouting. Company, halt, I shouted. Among the clamour of sergeants and senior cadets, no one heard me. They can't hear you, a senior cadet yelled in my face. I tried again. With the same result, I raised my hand and lowered it sharply. The cadet platoon commander yelled attention gesture commands. As my classmates lined up, several upperclassmen walked through the rows, not stopping to shout, Did you hear the command attention, candidate? Then why did you stand at attention, candidate? There is no hand signal for the command attention, candidate. And so on in the same vein. Finally, they let me command because the canteen would actually close. Then a running march to the canteen, pull-ups and push-ups outside. Inside, we sat on the edges of our chairs, forks raised strictly vertically and brought to our mouths at right angles. Such humiliations are commonplace at all officer candidate schools, but what does this have to do with flying? The answer is that in the army you are first of all a soldier and your specialty is the tenth thing. We had a long nine months ahead of us. In the first week I had to get us to class on time, make sure that the rooms were in perfect order and God forbid someone would have an untarnished plaque. The abuse didn't break me, I never once cried like some, but still my reactions were unsatisfactory. My tormentors yelled at me and I yelled back. Resistance plus obvious inexperience served me poorly for command. SGT, Malone, whose office had a sign that read Candidatus Desatus, often whispered in my ear as I stood in formation, you're not going to make it, candidate. And indeed, 
After four weeks of pre-flight training, Malone placed me on a list of 28 candidates for expulsion. I remember sitting in the evening in the dimly lit hallway the day before I met with the expulsion committee and how disgusted I felt at the time. I'd failed before I even got a chance to sit in the cockpit of the helicopter. If I got kicked out of flight school, I'd have to be an infantryman for the next three years. That's a shame. Ray Ward and I went through basic and advanced infantry training to get into flight school, and I screwed up the first month. When the list was posted, Ray cheered me up, telling me that I was doing well, that they weren't going to expel me. I remembered the threats Malone had whispered to me. The platoon commander also announced that he had analysed my handwriting and found out that I wasn't fit to be a pilot at all. I knew I'd be on that list. And I was. Patience and I decided that she and our son Jack, who was a month old, would live with my parents in Florida until I finished my training. Then they would move to Texas and live near the base. I almost called and told her I'd ruined everything. But I couldn't. I decided to break the news after the commission. The next day, the 28 doomed candidates were called one by one. When my name was called after lunch, I was exhausted. I remember walking into the room where the committee was meeting, shaking with fear and tension. I sat down on the edge of a chair in the middle of the room. The major looked at me for a few seconds, then began to read the report in front of him. The other seven commissioners watched intently. The Major spoke, and the stenographer's fingers fiddled with the typewriter. It says here that you have shown no enthusiasm in your training as a commander. The instructors say that you were not seriously interested in your duties when you were selected for the position of cadet company commander. And that's when I spoke up. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I was calm and reasonable, even though I felt the opposite. I said that I had just come from basic training and had no experience that I was serious about finishing my schooling but apparently had not been able to adequately demonstrate that, that I had been flying since I was 17. I want to be a helicopter pilot. That's what I've been training for, and I think my ground training grades prove it. Someday I'm going to graduate and drive soldiers around, and I'm going to be the best pilot to ever graduate from this school. Can you give me a chance? I spoke for about five minutes. The stenographer nodded as a sign that all the words were recorded. The Major made a note in my file. Go back to your company, we'll call you in. I waited with packed duffel bags, noticing how classmates avoided me and other candidates for elimination. When the messenger from the command called my last name, my soul went to the heels. I burst into the cadet company headquarters, stood at attention and shouted. Candidate Mason is here on your orders, Sergeant. Malone only glanced at my feet and yelled. You stepped over the white line, candidate. Get out and come in again. I turned in a circle, stepped out, and tried again to stand so that I could lightly touch the toes of my boots to the white line in front of Malone's desk without looking down. On the fourth time I succeeded. Malone approached me from the side with an important look. I stared at the wall in front of me. Malone said in my ear, it's hard for me to say this, but the expulsion committee in its infinite wisdom has decided not to expel your ass. I turned around, smiling at the news. Straight ahead, candidate. I stretched out in a string. Yes, they decided to reinstate you despite my desperate protests, I must say. So get your happy ass back to company. Get out of here. I turned and ran, laughing all the way back to the barracks. I called Patience and told her to come over. The next morning I was called back to headquarters. The board's decision to reinstate me had upset the ratio of cadets to flight instructors. Malone was triumphant. So candidate Mason, you'll have to go through pre-flight training again with the next class. Maybe this time you'll get kicked out. The second time through pre-flight training was much easier for me. I had already been to all the classes, so I only passed the exams with honours. I learned how to play the role of a zealous commander. I became an almost perfect candidate, but Malone didn't relent. You've had enough practice, Candidate Mason. Two months after I entered the base through the main gate, I was finally cleared to fly. We were issued flight suits, flight helmets, 
flight helmets, flight gloves, sunglasses, jeppies and plotters, navigation triangles, and new textbooks. We were told to wear our caps backwards, a hallmark of candidates who had not yet flown out on their own. We were still running around, but they gave us rides to the airfield. Finally, we began to study for real. Wee entered a low building next to the main helipad and sat at grey tables with four candidates per table. The squadron commander spoke to us briefly, then the instructor pilots entered. They were mythical beings before whom we stood in awe. They were civilians. We had already heard hundreds of stories about their training methods, their temper, and how they liked to get rid of cadets to reduce their workload. They were dressed in the same grey flight suits as we were, a kind of mechanics jumpsuit with a zipper from groin to throat and lots of pockets everywhere. They had something sticking out of every pocket. It was clear from their scruffy appearance that they had certain privileges. The instructor pilot who approached us was to take the four of us on a familiarisation flight, the only free ride in the course. We prepared for the day by learning the controls of the helicopter and basic manoeuvres. Many of ours thought they could fly the helicopter on their own in as little as an hour. I spent a lot of time in my room studying the controls of the helicopter, memorising how they worked and how I would have to move my arms and legs in the future. It was as if I could hear the voice of the aerodynamics instructor from pre-flight training in my head the names of the helicopter controls are related to their effects on the rotating blades and tail rotor, he said. The disc formed by the blades of the tail rotor is what actually flies. The rest of the fuselage just follows it, suspended from the shaft of the propeller. Sitting in my chair, I tried to visualise this disc spinning overhead as clearly as possible. Then I began to check the controls. The pitch and gas lever is located on the left side of the pilot's chair. When you pull it toward you, the pitch angle of all the blades of both main rotors increases, causing the disc and the helicopter to lift. When you lower the lever, when you reduce the pitch and the disc descends. The throttle correction knob at the end of the pitch gas lever must be coordinated with the up and down movements of the lever. You add throttle by increasing pitch and decrease it by lowering the lever. I raised and lowered my left arm close to my body, rotating my hand. The cyclic pitch control knob rises from the cockpit floor right between the pilot's legs. Moving the knob in either direction causes the blades to increase pitch and rise higher on one side of the disc, then decrease pitch and lower on the other. This cyclic change in pitch causes the propeller disc to pitch up and move in the same direction you move the knob. Now my left hand, which I was moving up and down and rotating, was joined by my right hand, which I used to make small circles above my knees. In my imagination I was already flying. The force rotating the propeller clockwise tries to rotate the fuselage in the opposite direction. This effect is called reactionary torque. It is controlled by the rudder propeller, a tail rotor located at the end of the tail beam. As the propeller rotates, it pushes the tail, counteracting the reactive torque. The pressure force, as well as the direction of the nose, is controlled by foot pedals. Depressing the left pedal increases the pitch of the tail propeller, which pushes the tail to the right against the reaction torque, moving the nose to the left. The right pedal decreases the pitch and allows the reaction torque to move the nose to the right. Since left and right turns require more and less power, you need to adjust the throttle to maintain the correct engine and propeller speeds. Understood. I thought I did. I moved my left hand up and down rotating my hand, controlling imaginary propeller pitch, and throttle my right hand described small circles, as if I were controlling a cyclic pitch my feet pressed imaginary pedals, controlling the tail rotor. Gradually I learned to perform all these movements simultaneously. This training and my airplane pilot's license gave me confidence that I would learn to fly a helicopter on the first try. OK, see that tree? The instructor's creaky voice rumbled through the headphones. I was finally getting my chance. The instructor held the training H-23 Hiller in a hover in the centre of the ten-acre field. Yes, sir, I replied, pressing the intercom button on the control stick. I'm taking over the rest of the controls. All you have to do is hold this bird toward the tree. He pointed at the tree with his chin. I nodded. Got it? Yes, sir. 
I was stunned by the noise, chatter, and vibration of the H-23. The blades were spinning frantically overhead parts I knew from static textbook drawings were continuously spinning and vibrating, and the engine was rumbling behind me. All the parts wanted to fly in their own direction, but somehow the instructor controlled them, averaging their various movements and keeping the helicopter three feet above the grass. We hovered above the ground, gently rising and falling on invisible waves. Okay, I'll give it to you, the instructor said. I pushed one pedal, then the other, trying to turn the car around while the instructor operated the step gas lever and cyclic pitch. All I had to do was point the helicopter at the tree. The tree swung sharply to one side, then the other. Are you sure you see the tree I'm talking about? Yes, sir. Well, then point us there, if you would be so kind. This instructor, like all the others from basic training, was a civilian who had once served in the military. Being a civilian now had no effect on his cynical teaching style. I tried to focus. What's wrong with me? I mean, I know how to fly an airplane. I know the theory of how to fly a helicopter. I've learned all the controls. Why can't I keep this damn tree in front of us? Rocking back and forth in decreasing amplitude, adjusting to the gentle resistance of the pedals, I finally managed to keep the tree at about a 20 degree angle. Not bad. Thank you, sir. You've done well with the pedals. Now, let's see how the throttle steer knob works. Very good, sir. So, I'll take over the controls again, the instructor put his feet on the pedals, and the tree immediately froze. And I'll give you a chance to try your luck with the step gas. Just step gas, nothing else. Try to keep us at this altitude. Understood. Yes, sir. Relinquish. That's always the word for handing over control. Roger that. I grabbed the throttle step knob, and in the same second the helicopter, which had been hovering serenely three feet in the air, jerked upward to five, as if it had thrown itself up. To correct this, I pushed the handle down, but again too hard. The car jerked downward, the seat belt straining. When the ground was directly below us, I panicked and pulled up again too hard. Three feet is good enough for me. Yes, sir. I fought to maintain a constant altitude, sweat dripping from my forehead. It wasn't enough just to keep the handle in the right position, constant adjustments were required. After a few minutes of yo-yo bouncing around, I was able to keep the car at three feet of altitude. That's very good. You're a natural talent, boy. Thank you, sir. I'll take over he took over the pitch throttle. On a side note, when you raise the throttle, it takes more power, so the torque increases to compensate for that, you push down a little on the left pedal, and a little on the right pedal when you reduce the throttle. Yes, sir. Now let's try the control stick. You don't have to move it too much. I looked at the instructor's right hand resting on the cyclic pitch control knob. It was wobbling. The top of the knob was shaking along with the dangling car. I'd say the knob is moving great, sir. I didn't say it wasn't moving. I said you shouldn't move it much. That's the difference. The H23 is known for excessive knob movement. That's from all that unbalanced stuff spinning around up there. Try it. Giving it back. I got it. Um. I put my hand on the trembling handle between my knees and felt strong mechanical jolts in many directions, my knuckles instantly turning white from the strain. The rest of the instruments were controlled by the instructor. The H-23 held position for a few seconds, then it began to drift to the left. I pulled the twitching knob to the right to correct the situation. It didn't work, we were still drifting to the left. I moved the handle to the right. The helicopter stopped going left, but it didn't hover in place like I wanted. It tilted to the right and flew that way. It was like it was completely out of control. I quickly moved the handle back to the left, but the machine kept going to the right. The helicopter was showing its stubborn nature. I thought the helicopter had gone wild. Damn it! I stepped up the opposition and it stopped as under control, and then flew in the opposite direction. It's fine with me if you hold the helicopter at one point. 
After a number of tentative jerks in various directions, I figured out how to control in such cases. After five minutes, I was still able to stay in a ten by ten foot square. What's up, Ace? You got it? Thank you, sir. Now that we've mastered the cyclic step, let's try to control the whole thing. Ready, boy? Yes, sir. Okay, you got it. Roger that. The control knob vibrated, the throttle step lever jerked, the pedals hit my feet. For a brief moment I was in complete control. I hovered three feet off the ground in a real helicopter. A faint smile crept across my sweaty face. The illusion that I had everything under control was gone. I focused on the control stick to hold us in place while we climbed. I lowered the lever to reduce altitude and noticed we were flying backwards and fast. Pushed the knob forward. Now we were turning 90 degrees. Fixed it with the pedals. Every control was fighting me individually. I'd forgotten that I had to push the left pedal when I lifted the throttle. I forgot that the control stick responds with a delay. We spun and rumbled haphazardly, changing altitude incessantly. Too many things needed my attention. The instructor, a man of courage, let the car lurch, rumble and spin over the entire pad while I pushed the pedals, pulled the lever and ripped the handle, all with meagre results. It felt like I was holding ragged reins and the horses were hurtling toward a cliff. I couldn't even come close to driving the car the way I wanted to. Accepted. The instructor took control of the helicopter. The engine and propeller speeds returned to green. We smoothly descended from 15 feet to 3, turned from the sun to the tree, and returned to the point where we started. I felt completely wrecked. I was told you could do it all, and it turns out you weren't fooled. What do you mean, sir? You're a born helicopter pilot. A natural. Sir, I was flapping all over the place. Don't worry about it, kid. It's just that with each training session the pad's going to get smaller. The real training with regular instructors began the next day at a training field, one of many scattered across the Texas prairies. Thus, each flight took place on a separate flying field, and the novices were separated from the experienced cadets. The first test was a solo flight. Up to this point, the instructors focused on the basic maneuvers hover, takeoff, landing and a forced landing called autorotation. In the army, we were taught to fly as if the engine could fail at any moment. While hovering, taking off, landing or just flying, the instructor could shut off the engine to see how you would react. When the instructor decided you were ready for a real crash, you would be allowed to fly on your own. My instructor, Tom Anderson, liked to cut the throttle when we would drag sideways or get caught in the jet from another helicopter's propeller or soar too high when hovering. He needed to see how we would react when everything that could go wrong did. There was no way to prepare for that. We learned how to react when an engine failed blindly. There are two ways to autorotate. When hovering when the engine has failed, keep the pitch gas in the same position until the skids are six inches above the ground, then pull it up to soften the landing. When flying, you should push the handle down at once to reduce the pitch angle. With a gentle descent, the propellers continue to turn, providing lift as the helicopter descends. If you hold the pitch throttle in the flight position, the blades will slow down their rotation and stop. Because the propeller blades remain rigid only by the centrifugal force of rotation, the stopped blades fold up and the helicopter falls, just like an anvil, but with a streamlined shape. If you do not put the step gas handle down, you are waiting for a deplorable outcome. Autorotation is fast. The hilla in autorotation descends at 1,700 feet per second. At 500 feet, you have 20 seconds to react to engine failure, retract your pitch, find a place to land, and land. In this brief glide, you should lurk to any suitable spot within range. At about 50 feet off the ground, you should take the control stick to level the helicopter and attempt to slow it from 45 knots to zero. With the nose high while leveling off, one should wait until the tail rotor is close to the ground. Then add a little pitch and level the helicopter. The remainder of the pitch is used to soften the landing. In theory. At first I would hit the ground too hard, or add a step too soon, or land crookedly. 
After bouncing around a bit during landings and practicing hovering and auto rotations over the parking lot and on the training field track, we had to fly up to a marker at the end of one of the tracks. There I was to try to hover, talk to the control tower, and be ready to switch to auto rotation from hover at any moment. 079, track 3, ready for takeoff. Having said this, I would turn around 90 degrees, wait for permission, and take off. To take off from the hover position. It is necessary to slightly give the control stick away from yourself and add a little power by pulling up the throttle step, and at the same time turning the throttle correction knob to keep the RPM. The helicopter accelerates parallel to the ground quite rapidly, while still at hover height, and reaches the point of lift. Lift is the speed at which the propeller starts to work in an undisturbed atmosphere and immediately becomes more efficient. At this point, the helicopter feels as if it is bouncing, gaining altitude sharply. Once you have reached the lift point, you must maintain a constant airspeed and climb until you reach the altitude at which you turn, merging into the overall traffic pattern. Since there are six tracks on the training fields, it is very important to follow the traffic pattern exactly. Collisions in the air were common among the cadets. As we took off, we encountered autorotation on each side of the rectangular route. After a few laps around the route practicing landings and takeoffs, the instructors usually took us out into the neighborhood to practice flying the route and auto rotation. We spent about an hour each day in the cockpit and three or four hours on the bench watching our comrades. We studied flight school curricula, describing the mastering of maneuvers, went to theoretical classes on aerodynamics, meteorology, and maintenance. We lived and breathed flying, eagerly waiting for the first of us to make an independent flight. Two weeks later, it happened. We honoured him in the traditional way we threw him in the pond. He was now entitled to wear his cap with the visor forward. By the end of the third week, almost half the class was in the pond and wearing their cap's visor forward, and I was among them. By the end of the fourth week, those who were never allowed to fly individually were expelled. The next task was to master all the basic manoeuvres so well that in another four weeks to pass the examination flight we started flying more often. I flew with Anderson for one hour every day. He also scheduled an additional hour and a half of individual flying, during which we worked out our mistakes. The next time we flew together with the instructor, we had to show the best results. If the instructor was satisfied, you would become a pilot and a warrant officer, not an infantryman. All our energy and attention was given to performing manoeuvres in the air and worrying on the ground about whether everything went well there. The instructors viewed the cadets' mistakes as an attempt on their lives and acted accordingly. The instructors had several ways to show disapproval. Most of them yelled over the intercom after every mistake. One beat his cadets with a club. All of them gave bad grades to emphasize poor performance. But Tom Anderson, pointing out mistakes, showed terrible frustration. A week before my main exam flight, Anderson cut the engine as I flew toward the training field. I immediately dropped my pitch turned against the wind and glided down in auto-rotation, all actions on automatic. I was very proud that I had memorized the correct pitch down and was about to land. But Anderson had picked a spot so that turning up wind meant turning toward the power lines. Being a dumb candidate, I concentrated on executing the maneuver precisely. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Anderson shaking his head contritely. The feeling of pride and confidence in my skill was abruptly replaced by dread. I finally saw the power lines and turned sharply to the side, but now I was very low and flying into a group of trees. Anderson continued to shake his head sadly. Took control, he said. The hopeless tone of voice completed the sentence without words took control. Asshole, I nodded in agreement. How could I not see those wires? Anderson regained control, started the engine and gently guided us away from the trees. He looked at me as if he were at a funeral. Bob, if you land in the wires, they'll kill you. At that moment, his disappointment, I would have preferred death. Returning to flying altitude, he handed the controls back to me. Ed for the training field. Suddenly you might be able to land the helicopter without us getting hurt. He sighed. I nodded. I was anxious to get us back without adventure. I took over. Ah. Oh. Anderson nodded and leaned back crossing his arms. 
When I turned toward the field, he shut off the engine again at the same spot, next to the same power line. This time I first found a good place to land, then maneuvered to fly up against the wind. Anderson just sat there. We were fifty feet from the landing spot I had chosen, and Anderson never took over. I realized he was going to let me follow through. I hit the ground, dragged twenty feet, and stopped in a shallow ditch I hadn't noticed. That's better, he said, smiling. I knew I would now pass my exam. After the exam, we got into some complex maneuvers takeoff and landing on confined areas and peaks, cross-country navigation, night flying, and autorotations. Anderson very carefully showed us the proper way to get in and out of confined areas. The method was aimed at minimizing damage. A helicopter under cadet control hanging out in a restricted area that could end sadly. You fly around the chosen spot several times until you find the best approach path over the lowest obstacles, upwind. Then you pick a spot and land. On the ground, you lock step gas on low throttle and exit the helicopter without shutting down the engine. You place a rock or stick under the forward cockpit so that the object can be seen from inside. Then you walk to the leeward side of the pad, measuring a distance equal to the length of the helicopter plus five paces from the nearest obstacle for backup, and leave another mark. You then measure the distance in steps and see if you can turn in a hover over the first marker without hitting the trees on the leeward side of the pad. If so, the calculation is over and you can return to the helicopter. If you can't do that and have to fly tail forward from windward marker to leeward marker, you need to put a series of marks between the two points to help you fly that way. All the sights were different. Some required a lot of measuring and marking. Others were large and unobstructed, so the mush of setting marks seemed pointless. Months later in Vietnam, I realized I was machine gauging each pad before I landed. The mush came in handy. Sometimes, to save time, Anderson would take two cadets on demonstration flights. One day we landed on a very small, cramped pad marked with a red tyre. This meant that only instructors were allowed to land there. We hovered over the front of the pad, and the tail rotor was only a couple of feet from its rear boundary. Anderson pitched the car back a little and tried to take off. Several factors were against us. First, it was very hot and the air density was low, so the lift was less than normal. Second, the helicopter was overloaded for that air density. Anderson tried to go over the trees but had to abort the takeoff midway and return back to the pad. The helicopter was unable to climb. I suggested we get out and walk to the nearest field. No need, Anderson said. It hovered again and began circling over the tiny site, narrowly missing trees with its blades. My classmate and I thought he was crazy. But after two laps, we realized what he was trying to do. He was accelerating to a bleak blowing speed. When the car tilted enough, Anderson steered the helicopter between two trees and took off. He made it. It was a piece of jewelry I'll never forget that take off. There's always a way out. A few days later, my five month course at Fort Walters ended with an exhausting hour long test flight, during which I successfully demonstrated my skills to an army inspector. We were to continue the course at Fort Rucker.we, arrived at the new base having flown 85 hours at Walters, and added another 88 on the Sikorsky H-19.we, learned how to land and take off from limited unmarked areas, land on peaks, and did a lot of cross-country and tactical flying. In the last month we have flown 27 hours in our dream helicopter, the Bell, a one Iroquois, known as the Huey. The time on the Huey was spread out like this 10 hours of familiarization flights over terrain and 17 hours of instrument flights. Although we had improved our skills noticeably, our novice status did not change in any way. By the end of training we were senior candidates at Walters, but became junior cadets at Rucker, although it was not a complete reversal. Married cadets were allowed to live with their wives off base. The two training helicopters we flew at Rucker were far apart in terms of technical development. Sikorsky H-19 looked like a giant toad on four wheels and was so tall that the cockpit had to be climbed up a built-in ladder. This monster was powered by a heavy 13-cylinder star engine, greatly reducing its potential payload capacity. If all ten seats in the cargo passenger compartment were filled, it was practically impossible to hang on. It had to take off at a run-up even with a moderate load. The Huey, on the other hand, 
had a powerful light engine and plenty of power. It could hang and take off with ten passengers and a crew of two aboard. It was quiet, easy to start on cold mornings, and easier to maintain. Flying the two machines was a hands-on lesson in the history of helicopter construction. Despite its shortcomings, the H-19 was a good training helicopter. In the H-23, the controls and the rotor were mechanically linked. You had to apply a lot of effort. The H-19 had hydraulic controls and light touches were sufficient. With sensitive controls and insufficient power, it flew like an overpowered Huey. We thought we would jump into a new training helicopter and show the new instructors that we were pilots. But on the first flight, the H-19 just picked up and dropped to the ground when the instructor handed over the controls. The mistake is moving the control stick too much. That knocks the air cushion out from under the propeller. Resort to applying pressure. If you see the controls moving, you've overdone it. This helicopter will teach you delicate controls. It did. Within a couple hours, I wasn't thinking about the controls at all. I was just enjoying flying this monster. The last 20 or so hours of training on the H-19 we spent in the field, simulating air assault raids as part of cadet helicopter companies. We flew reconnaissance, day and night flights, took turns planning and leading air assault attacks, which involved many helicopters moving in a dispersed combat order. Training on the H-19 was coming to an end, and in theory classes we were learning more and more about the Huey. Huey is the Army's newest multi-role helicopter, the announcer said in the training movie. The screen was filled with a close-up of a Huey flying low over the ground. The camera zoomed in and showed a close-up of the main rotor hub rotating above the engine nacelle. The T-53L11 gas turbine engine develops 1,100 horsepower and weighs only 500 pounds. The turbine is essentially a jet engine with a fan in the exhaust and animated inset showed the engine in section. A 12-inch fan was spinning in the flow of gases from the jet engine. This single fan is connected to the transmission by a shaft running through the engine. The pressure of the gases flowing through the fan creates enough power to spin a 48-foot main propeller and an 8-foot tail rotor and lift a machine weighing 5,000 pounds, along with a maximum load of 4,500 pounds into the air. The animation disappeared, and we were shown the Huey performing a roll turn and preparing to dive into the jungle. The Huey's streamlined shape allows for a maximum cruising speed of 120 knots at this point we laughed, because our H-19s were doing 80 knots. The movie showed the Huey on the landing pad. Under the announcer's voice, the helicopter began to climb vertically. Although not recommended, the Huey is capable of climbing vertically to 10,000 feet. The movie went on to show different variations an ambulance helicopter that could hold six stretchers a heavily armed helicopter with machine guns, rockets and rocket launchers, and a transport helicopter that could hold ten soldiers plus two crew members firing machine guns through the door. I was absolutely thrilled with this machine. When the instructor pressed the starter button on the step gas, lever and the high-speed launch engine slowly revved its blades, I heard only a long howl instead of the usual clanking cough and roar. At operating speed there was no roar, no vibration, no shaking, just the soft howl of the turbine. The instructor signalled for me to raise the throttle pitch. The propellers thudded as the pitch increased, and the helicopter lifted off the ground, as if falling upward. I overpedalled and the tail wagged back and forth. Because of the helicopter's sensitive controls this happened often, and was called Huey fidgeting. The heavy thud of the main rotors, the characteristic whoop, 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 was due to their enormous size, 48 feet from and to, plus a 21-inch cord. Ballast weights at the ends of the blades imparted enormous inertia to the rotating propeller system. The instructor demonstrated this inertia by performing a trick of which only a Huey is capable. On the ground at normal propeller speed, he cut the engine, lifted the helicopter four feet, hovered, turned 360 degrees, and landed again. Amazing. Any other helicopter would have just stayed put, wouldn't have risen an inch when the blades slowed down. Those big metal blades with weights on the ends served me well in Vietnam. Because of their power and inertia, they sliced through small tree branches with ease. During Huey familiarization flights, patients coached me at home through a list of questions. 
She chose negative reinforcement as her method, kicking me in the leg for every mistake. I memorized it so well that even now I can feel the pain in my leg when I think back to the pre-flight instrument check. We completed the familiarization flights on the Huey in two weeks, flying an hour a day. It was time for instrument flights. We were among the first to be taught to fly by instrument. Usually helicopter pilots maintained eye contact with the ground. For the old pilots, VFR was no different than IFR. In a severe thunderstorm, they just flew slower or lower. If conditions got really bad, they'd land in a field. But that simple philosophy came to an end. Helicopters were going to war, and in war you can't fly slower, lower, or land, because the weather is bad. I liked flying blind. You get in a Huey with an instructor, put on a hood, fly over all of Alabama, practice landing at airports you've never been to, and come back in one or two hours without ever seeing the ground, the sky, or anything else but the inside of the cockpit. On my final exam flight, I flew from Fort Rucker to Gainesville in Florida and back, made four approaches to unfamiliar airfields, and crossed two routes. This magical flight lasted four hours. The only signs that I was flying were moving instrument arrows and conversations with various control towers. The training came in handy for me in Vietnam only a few times, but each time it saved lives. On May 11, 1965, we received our warrant officer epaulettes and silver wings. Both my father and sister, Patience and Jack, came to congratulate me. I was very proud of myself. It had been the most eventful ten months of my 23 years of life. 60% of our graduating class was immediately sent to Vietnam. I remained among those who we thought were fortunate enough to serve in the States. It was an illusion. I asked for and was assigned to the third transportation company at Fort Belvoir, Virginia Special Flights to Transport VIPs. This unit shuttled senators and congressmen around Washington, D.C., and was available around the clock for immediate takeoff to get specific people to underground facilities in case hard times came. The service usually lasted a year and a half to two years, and it was too good for newly minted pilots. Such a sinecure should be for old servicemen. The base was kept in perfect order, there was plenty of entertainment in Washington, and the luxurious officers' club overlooked the Potomac. We were so stupid we didn't realise we were on a waiting list and would only be here for a few weeks. Patience. And I went out to buy furniture for our first apartment since our wedding day dot for a few weeks we lived like normal people. I would wake up in the morning, put on my orange flight suit, and drive to a field that was ten miles away. There I would retrain for two or three hours on a twin-rotor Piasetsky helicopter. Then I'd loiter around, chatting with the other pilots. Some of them had already been to Vietnam. They told me that in Saigon you could buy a stereo system for about a third of the price. Here's what I learned about Vietnam. It's a good place to buy stereos. Many of these pilots were on missions supporting the Republic of Vietnam armed forces in this scheduled war, the purpose of which was to keep control of South Vietnam because of the growing popularity of Ho Chi Minh. The Vietnamese communists in the South, the Viet Cong, had not stopped fighting since President Diem refused to hold scheduled free elections in 1956. I didn't know it then, but I did know that our pilots spoke of the VSRV as reluctant warriors in the US. Operation. They were taking Vietnamese troops to battles that those troops were mostly losing. Meanwhile, the Viet Cong continued to grow stronger. Three weeks later, I was assigned to Fort Benning, Georgia. No explanation. What the fuck is going on at Fort Benning? I asked a friend who'd gotten the same order. They're forming a big new division there. Maybe we're going to Vietnam. What? Fort Benning was home to the 11th Air Assault Division, which had been practicing air attacks and testing helicopters for over two years. After several major military exercises in North and South Carolina, where the 11th Air Assault Division fought against an enemy posed as the 101st Airborne Division, it was decided that the methods were working and a real air assault division should be formed to go to Vietnam. Since both pilots and helicopters were already on base, they simply changed the name of the experimental division to 1st Air Mobile Division and requested more pilots and aircraft for reinforcement. Hundreds of pilots arrived at Benning in mid-June, but until July 28th, we were told there was no reason to reinforce. Rumours of being sent to Vietnam are false, but don't be in a hurry to rent a place here, is how they put it. 
We were given a crash course in the use of some techniques invented by the experienced fighters of the experimental division. Their specialty was low-altitude flight, so-called shaving flight. This technique was supposed to minimize ground fire. They had a special low-altitude route, a confidence course in which we were taught to fly under high-voltage wires and turn so low that the tips of the blades almost touched the ground. These guys were real cowboys. On one sortie with former pilot Bill James, we flew as fast and as low as I had ever flown in my life. Along with three Air Force pilots, James flew along a railroad track bordered by tall trees. At over a hundred knots he spiralled into this narrow channel. The blades brushed the tops of the trees. It was something. The Air Force pilots yelled, He's gone crazy. Tell him to stop. Stop hearing the shouts. James increased the throttle. At 120 knots between two rows of trees, the world merged into a green blur. I have no idea how James navigated. Next, the old guys perfected formation combat. In flight school, formation was two or more helicopters flying within sight of each other in the sky. We were not taught to fly in close formation, it was considered dangerous. But for four Hueys to be in a small landing zone at the same time, they must fly, land and take off very close together. The closeness was measured in propeller diameters. For the old guys it was two or three diameters. In reality they flew at a distance of one propeller or less. When I first saw it, visions danced in my head of these blades coming together, spinning in opposite directions, and crashing. There was also chatter that these devils flew with the propellers overlapping by a few feet for fun. I had more often watched these manoeuvres being performed shaving, flying in close formation than I had performed them myself. We had too little time. The new pilots were learning to fly the Huey and had been through air assault training in Vietnam. When it was announced that we had to turn in our underwear to be painted olive green and cover our flight helmets with the same paint, it was clear that the X hour was near. On July 28th, I watched President Lyndon Johnson's televised speech in which he said we are staying in Vietnam. And today I have ordered the Air Mobile Division to be sent to Vietnam. I was overcome with elation mixed with fear. The games were over. Life as a helicopter pilot was getting serious dot the next day. In a fit of grim reckoning, I bought a double-barreled Derringer, my secret weapon for a last chance. My sister Susan drove up from Florida to pick up Patience and Jack. I felt cheated. I hadn't been given the opportunity to live a normal human life with my wife and son for at least a month. Now I would be gone for a year, maybe forever. Patience and Jack lived five months in a hot room in Texas, four months in a trailer in Alabama, a month in an empty apartment in Virginia, and the last month in another trailer in Georgia. I felt I wasn't providing for them very well, and now, on top of everything else, I was going off to war. The situation was made worse by the fact that I didn't believe in the just cause I was already interested in reading about Vietnam, and I believed that the Vietnamese should decide for themselves what kind of government they wanted, just as we did. If they want communists, let them be communists. They may not like communism well, everyone is free to make mistakes. If democratic capitalism was nicer to them, they would fight for it. Perhaps my feeling that the Vietnam War was pointless was born out of a fear of dying young. It was an epiphany that came too late. I went off to war. I owed the army three years of service for teaching me how to fly helicopters. All I had to do was clean up the mess. I took Jack in my arms and we smiled into the lens together. Patience took the picture. We climbed into the car and drove to the base. As the soldiers put the duffel bags on the buses, I hugged Patience, she was crying. In a daze I watched my sister, my wife and my son get into the car and drive away. In the parking lot, surrounded by hundreds of green-clad people huddled around the Greyhound buses, I felt very lonely. We drove from Columbus to Mobile where we were loaded onto Croton aircraft carriers. It took a total of four aircraft carriers, six troop carriers and seven cargo ships to move the entire division to the other side of the world. I, an advance party of a thousand men, was sent by air. They were to meet us at a camp set up in the highlands near the village of Anke. We went aboard. I struggled with my huge sack, dragging it through the dark corridors. As I scrambled through the hatch, the heavy sack ripped a button off my uniform. 
The air was stale and sour, and the steel bulkheads were covered with nasal rust. I reached the deck below the overhanging flight deck, pulled the bag up to the hatch, trying to figure out how to get it down without breaking anything. Drop it, Chief Warrant shouted from the bottom of the ladder. He was standing on the deck where we were stationed. That sack. I questioned him. Well, yes, throw it to me. You're not bringing it down. It weighs as much as I do. Look, Chiff, you want to make a jam? Throw it to me. When I threw the sack, Warrant took a step back. The sack crashed to the steel deck. I thought you were going to catch him. Was I. Warrant grinned. There's your bunk over there. Have a nice trip. Chapter 2. The August Cruise We don't want a growing conflict with consequences no one can foresee we won't intimidate and show our strength. But we will not surrender, and we will not retreat. Lyndon Johnson, July 28, 1965 August 1965 On the crowded ship, I finally got to know all the officers of my company. During the month of hectic training and boot camp at Fort Benning, I hadn't memorized who was who. I was assigned to Company B of the 229th Helicopter Transport and Airborne Battalion, of which there were two in the 1st Airmobile Division. The company commander was Major John Fields, who was replaced a couple months after arriving in Vietnam. Fields was well liked, but I never got to know him intimately. My platoon commander was capped. Robert Shaker, a black, tall and lean professional, generally a hard nut to crack. My squad leader, on the other hand, was capped. Dan Farris, a tough-looking, double-jointed man with a permanent smile, the man I would interact with most often in Vietnam. Military, but with a great psyche. God damn it, Connors. You elbowed me in the eye, growled Len Riker, a tall and lean chief warrant officer second class. I'm sorry, Len. I'm sick of that fucking Mae West. When Ensign Wall and Colonel Dogwell were doing drill drills, we'd pass the time by watching Connor's fiddle with his inflatable vest. Even if the wait stretched into half an hour, he always managed to get the vest on at the very last minute. Pat Connors was our company flight instructor and part-time clown. That's it, he slipped his shoulder under his belt, straightened up sharply, and immediately fell on top of his comrade, Banjo Bates. Oops. Pardon me, miss. Back off, Connors. I'm not interested in your antics. Banjo crossed his arms over his vest and frowned, turning away from Connors. Bates always looked utterly exhausted, except when Connors entertained him. Connors continued to grin in Banjo's face, ignoring his comrade's sullen look. What the hell, Banjo said irritably. All right, I may have to endure these stupid drill drills almost every day to prove that I know how to put on a life jacket. But I still have to put up with a blithering idiot like you, Connors. He turned around, smiling back at the satisfied Connors. Aish at ease, Shaker commanded. Farris and the other squad leaders followed. All right, roll call. Shaker began to read out the names. I still didn't know the names of most of the guys in my platoon. In the second platoon, I knew Wendell, the photography buff, his buddy Barber, and the amateur modeler Captain Morris, and his buddy Decker, the second in command chief warrant officer. Daisy. Here. Capped. Don Daisy loved arguing politics and played a lot of chess. Farris. Captain Dan Farris. I liked him from the start. Gottler. Chief Warrant Officer Second Class Frank Gottler, a quiet man with a slight German accent who claimed to have flown in the Luftwaffe. Kaiser. Chief Warrant Officer Second Class Bill Kaiser. Short, quick-eyed, very aggressive, Disobeyed no one, liked to gamble and won all the time. If he'd been in a flying fire support team instead of the slicks, he'd have been a real thug, I'm sure. Liz. Chief Warrant Officer 3rd Class Ron Liz. The most senior warrant officer in our platoon. That rank was roughly equivalent to captain. Liz seemed like a puny, pale elf, but he had extensive experience flying gliders during the battles over the Pacific and fighter planes in Korea. He often conversed in low voices with Gottler. The first time he was in an air mobile division, he had to take a forced leave of absence from his office to fly to Vietnam. 
After Connors, he was the best pilot in our company and the most experienced fighter. Mason. Warrant Officer First Class Bob Mason. IA. A total newcomer to the division, yesterday's flight school graduate. Only 250 hours of flying time. I was 5 feet 10 inches tall, weighed 140 pounds, and boldly wore my dark brown hair a little longer than the others. I had high cheekbones and a squinted eye. I tried to fit in. Nate. Another senior warrant officer second class. He often smoked a pipe and spoke in a chesty voice that didn't fit his modest build at all. Wrestler. Warrant Officer Gary Wrestler. Another newcomer to the division and the Army Air Corps. Riker. Here. After getting elbowed in the eye by Connors, the already ruddy Riker flushed to the shade of boiled lobster. He was a serious guy, almost completely humorless. That's good. Mm. Captain Shaker rolled up the personnel list, slipped it under his arm, and waited for the inspection. Unlike the others, he didn't wear crumpled flight suits. After his morning warm-up, he put on his field uniform and polished boots. As a platoon leader, he considered himself first and foremost a soldier and only then a pilot. As soon as Shaker finished roll call, Navy Ensign Wall and Ground Forces Colonel Roger Dogwell appeared from around the corner on the opposite side of the ship. Wall always looked like he was bursting with laughter. He was the only Navy representative aboard, so he commanded the ship, and was on the same level in rank as Dogwell. It was written all over the Dewey Dogwell's face that he wanted to curl Ensign Wall into a nautical knot. The Shaker saluted languidly, and the grinning Ensign tapped his forehead with his finger. Dogwell frowned. Is everything in place? The Ensign asked. Yes, Mr. Wall. Everything is in place. In Shaker's tone he asked, Where do you think they're walking in the park? Sir, where's Banjo? Connors asked suddenly. I'm here, asshole Banjo elbowed Connors. Oh, thank God, thank God. That's enough. Ten. Shaker turned around and glared. Wall grinned. Dogwell looked emphatically evil. The colonel uttered only one word the entire trip pilots. Liz sat down with me at breakfast. I've assigned you to be the pilot to transport the soldiers off the ship when we get to Quinion, he smiled. Really? I smiled back weakly. I still wasn't sure about flying the Huey. Is something wrong? Liz asked. You don't look well. Are the munchies coming back up? No, the munchies are fine. I doubt I can get the Huey in the air from the ship. It says here he showed me a pencil note that you've been trained on the Huey. On all four models. He looked at me. Yes, I did fly them, but mostly by instrument under the hood. I flew about ten visual hours with an instructor. How long ago did you graduate from flight school? I noticed the wrinkles around his eyes from smiling as he studied the records. The middle of May. And you lack the confidence to take off from a ship. That's right. That's right. Okay, he put the notes on the plastic tablecloth next to the tray of food. I just assigned you to fly with me. Thank you. I really didn't feel like ending the trip in the ocean. Oh, come on. I'm sure you'd do a great job, but I need a co-pilot, and from what you say you need practice. After breakfast, I went back to my bunk to get the tech chart and realised I had almost forgotten the launch procedure. I pulled the tech chart out of my flight tablet and headed to the hangar to find a suitable Huey for practice. The aisle from our hold through the interior of the ship to the mess hall was like a jungle littered with boxes, bags, spools, barrels, crates and Hueys. Usually this aisle was crowded with people, but I was fortunate enough to be in the changing of dining room attire. In the middle of the deck, I squeezed between two fuselages and walked toward the light of a large lamp flickering above the Huey's cockpit. I just needed the helicopter away from the aisle. I didn't want to get caught up with the old timers these guys went through the whole launch procedure faster than I could light a Zippo. I opened the left cockpit door. Everything inside was familiar, except for the armoured pilot seats. The armour told me that bullets sometimes whistled in the cockpit too, 
Why had I argued so vehemently with the expulsion board? I was going into combat in one of those machines. As a child, such a prospect had never occurred to me when I fantasized about taking people out of flood zones, rescuing beautiful girls, or hovering over the tops of trees, picking apples. In those fantasies, no one shot at me. I sat down on the right side of the first pilot's seat and looked around. Our Hueys had no guns on board, except for the machine guns of the chief mechanic and the onboard gunner, so they were called slicks. Our job was to transport soldiers to the landing zones. The enemy could always fire at us from the ground. Unlike attack helicopter pilots, we had nothing to fire back with. I couldn't imagine what it was like. The armour added 350 pounds to the weight of the helicopter and took up two soldiers' seats. I tapped it with my knuckles. Ceramic and steel multilayer plates nearly half an inch thick were arranged around and under the seat, the seat itself made of an aluminum frame and draped in nylon mesh. A sliding armoured panel on the side of the seat protruded from the door side protection for the torso, but not the head. When we got to Vietnam, we'd be issued body armour. Everything looked secure. No one was shooting in the hangar on the deck of the Croton, so I thought the armour would protect against all bullets. I put the tech card on one of the radios on the panel between the two pilot seats and spun in place to get a good look at the cargo bay behind. It was shaped like a horseshoe because of the lintel-like cover of the transmission compartment and the hydraulic units just below the propeller shaft. Our two onboard gunners should be positioned on either side of the hellhole cover by the sliding doors, sitting behind M60 machine guns attached to turrets. For the first two months, however, the machine guns will simply stick out of the top of the open doors on elastic cables. With a senior mechanic and a machine gunner at his sides, the cargo bay could easily accommodate eight to ten soldiers. I turned back around and relaxed. As the Croton rolled over the waves, I studied the dashboard and thought about patience. 